Welcome to the Axial Podcast. Axial is an early stage investment firm based in San Francisco. We partner with great founders and inventors investing in early stage life science companies often when they are no more than an idea. Axial is fanatical about helping the rare inventor who is compelled to build their own enduring business. Okay, we're recording. Okay, Eric, thanks for taking right. the time to do this. Um, sure. Appreciate it. What a small world. You know, you're the father of Fred and Carl Ward, what called you them. So I can put two, two together. Now I do. Yeah, it's amazing. But they stay in time to, you know, join this podcast and talk about the story and ag bio. Maybe we can embarrass Carl and Fred too. That'd be funny. Um, a little <laughs> bit. They're funny stories. But uh, maybe you can just start off a brief introduction and go from there. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate the opportunity to do this. So um, I'll go way back. I, I was born in Buffalo, New York. Um, I came down here to North Carolina, where I live now, in 78 to start going to uh, Duke University. And that was the place where I really got super interested in plant biology. So it was a very old school university at that point. It had a botany and a zoology department, not even a single unified biology department. And I, I was a botany major and I cottoned on to that because I, I took a couple classes and really liked the other students that were in those classes and the teachers were phenomenally good and really focused on the students and learning. And it was not super top down. It was much more kind of a collegial environment, even as a little, you know, crummy sophomore taking a class from some eminent professor. And then as I went through school, I got more and more interested in, I guess, more reductionist stuff. So I got interested in biochemistry. And then I got interested in molecular biology and how molecules of life are created and all that. And right around that same time, I graduated in 82. That's that was really the dawn of the idea that you could do genetic engineering on plants. So this is like way back when, you know, Genentech and companies like that had been founded within the last few years. Uh, so I started to look around. I decided I wanted to do a PhD. I looked at several graduate schools. It was a really nascent field. There are probably only a half a dozen places in the country you could go where you could study anything like plant molecular biology at that point. Ended up at WashU in St. Louis. Um, were originally attracted to a woman named Mary Dell Chilton, who was working there, who subsequently left, actually. I'll come back to that. But she uh, was one of the two labs in the world that first showed that agrobacterium puts DNA into plant cells naturally as part of its life cycle, which led to the whole ability to put whatever gene you want to into a plant. Um, so I ended up working for a guy called Wayne Barnes there, learned an incredible amount from him, and very faithfully met a guy named Scott Euknes in the first day of graduate school. So the incoming cohort of plant biology students in late August of 82, I ran into this guy, Scott, and I'm still working with him today. He's the co-CEO of the company that we co-founded. So... It's only been 41 years now at this point. Come, yeah. Uh, anyway, so I uh, went to Wash U, decided I wanted to experiment with industry. So uh, a detail probably of the way I'm wired. I never, I didn't really see myself as going hardcore academic science. I was really interested in a lot of different things. I wouldn't call myself like a polymath, but I'm just like some somewhere between ADD and polymath, I get interested in a lot of stuff, including practical things about how companies run finance, all that stuff. So I decided, okay, I should probably scratch that itch and try the corporate world out. So I did a postdoc at a company called Sibagaigi, which is a 2X progenitor of the current Syngenta. And um, you know, next thing you know, I ended up spending 12 years there. I rose up through the ranks, I guess, because I had some modicum of common sense and ability to communicate pretty well, which is what all companies are looking for typically in like management positions. <laughs> and then uh, so the company merged once with Sando, CBI did to create Novartis. And then Novartis decided it was going to get out of the integrated life science business because they did everything from pharmaceuticals all the way down to nutrition, including ag and decided they were going to get rid of the ag business. So they spun out the ag business, as did Zeneca at the same time, now AstraZeneca. And those two together, the Zeneca and Novartis ag businesses, are what became Syngenta. And I, I went through the pre-integration year, a lot of the planning, 
And I saw how ugly the politics were getting around that stuff. And I left that company on day one of Syngenta being floated as a public company and just said, peace out. I've had enough. Can't do this. Um, it's no fun to have to go to work and kind of tell untruths to people every day to try to keep them motivated, that sort of thing. So in simultaneous with that, um, Scott had co-founded a, a company a few years earlier called Paradigm Genetics, which they successfully took public back in the, the first genomics revolution back in the year 2000. He was getting um, disenchanted with that company. It had kind of gotten big and it moved away from the stuff that he wanted to do. So he was leaving too. And together we started to you know, talk about ideas and we got enamored with this one specific technology. So together we started a company back at right at the end of 2000. So Scott was really the guy that put the breadcrumb trail out for me of like, here's what entrepreneurship can be. You don't have to, you know, work in an environment where you're not fully believing what you're doing and you can actually control your own destiny more. So, so we did that. Crop Solution was, um, interesting experience learned a ton it was around for about seven years never made any money um but it had some really interesting technology some licensing of stuff and um you know it's a great learning experience to go from nothing to how do you actually raise some money and get a company going and sometimes the counter examples are the best learnings right where you actually screw something up uh, and then i i left there when we basically ran the thing out of money and didn't have any more grants and all that and worked for a not-for-profit for about six years called the two blades foundation that was a historical connection to some people i'd known a long time ago so i guess lesson there is you know network a lot and do it for no good reason other than getting to know a lot of people because you just kind of never know um, what's going to happen and then i after being with two blades for six years started to think about what i might want to do next um i felt like i'd kind of done what i could there and scott had been in germany because the second company he was with a phoenix had been bought by buyer he came back from that in april of 2012 i'd been in england with two blades i came back in august or july of 2012 we started hanging out together again we'd seen each other in europe a couple times both living over there and he was kicking around ideas for another company and one thing led to another and he asked me if i wanted to help out so it's like yeah let's do it so we we started ag biome in the third fourth quarter of 2012 and that's where that's where i am now so that was you know, a little over 10 years ago so well you've little that's a great story you have all these different points we can talk about and you one of the few people who successfully built like an independent ag tech company uh the last decade or so and we talked about that but maybe we could back it all up in the 80s there's two questions when i ever talk to people who were doing science around the 70s 80s did you know it was a revolution and then second point how did you what was it like to try to be a scientist who didn't want to become a professor or wasn't all in on becoming a professor because versus now scientists the average PhD will talk to 20 VCs before they graduate. You know what I mean? So it's a whole different environment. But what was it like back then just being a scientist trying to forge your own path? Yeah, interesting points, Josh. So on the first one, I think I the first I felt like I might be on the edge of a revolution was um, there was a really interesting cat in the genetics department of Washington named Maynard Olson, who he was a mathematician who had pivoted to becoming a molecular geneticist, um, had a tenured position at Dartmouth, completely redid his career, postdoc with Ben Hall at UW, and then got this job at Wash U. And he was restriction mapping the yeast genome. And his what he wanted to do was prove to himself that a chromosome was actually a single individual DNA molecule. And I was always thought that I was like, well, that's what it says in the book. So, <laughs> but I realized now he was laying the groundwork for what we now think of like genome science as, right? Like actually figuring out how are you going to do this that eventually led to complete sequencing of the E. coli genome and the yeast genome and the C. elegans genome and ultimately the human genome. And that's when I started, you know first getting exposed to the idea of like, wow, if you could actually get the full sequence of everything you were working on, it would just change the world, right? You wouldn't have to do all this painful, convoluted genetics and positional cloning and all this stuff. And then, um, you know, on the, on the career stuff, I got very direct feedback from my thesis committee that I was 
they, I wouldn't say they told me I was throwing my life away, but they told me I was selling out at some level by doing you know, a postdoc in industry. And it's interesting because even back then, you know, like some careers, like let's say you, you were a chemist, it wasn't crazy you would go work for a chemical company, right? Or DuPont or somebody like that. But in, in biological sciences, it very much less than now, um, you, you didn't go into academia you know, you were doing some alternative career, which wasn't looked very kindly on. And I think that's, I think, you know, obviously it's changed a ton in the sort of biopharmaceutical world. It's almost a first choice for most people now. And in ag, it's certainly more that way than it's ever been, um, given the general interest in, in ag tech and investing in this area. But, you know, it was one of those, I, I guess I felt confident enough in how I was wired, I didn't take that as like, I'm, you know, I'm screwing up my career to not go into academia. I just saw what that was like. And I knew I didn't want to be that narrow and have to be that focused on kind of doing one thing. So, so in the eighties, nineties, you joined SIBA, you build a career there. And then how did you, uh, especially people early on in the career, you have a lot of opportunity costs and optionality. You're like, I can do this or that. How did you keep your conviction on agriculture despite all the ups and downs versus, you know, it's the eighties, nineties and you're seeing Genentech rise or you're seeing all this other stuff yeah. happening. How did you say, Hey, I'm going to stick with ag tech. I, you know, I, it's funny you ask that. I never really thought hard about doing anything else. You know, the closest I got to it was getting exposed to some companies that were doing things like natural product discovery, using you know fungi and plants that could potentially have pharmaceutical use that kind of got interesting for a little while um, but i was pretty down for the whole plant biology thing from the start i think the other thing that happened to me was i was fortunate when i was working at SIBA to be um, embedded enough in something that was like basic science that i was able to publish quite a bit it wasn't discouraged there at least so if you had the the drive to publish stuff you could do so as long as you kind of did it on your own time alongside your other stuff so i got a decent network within the hardcore academic community of that you know plant molecular biology field that was like this big when i started tiny kernel that grew out now so i knew all these people and you know i still have great friends in that community so i've always kind of sort of had one foot in academia the whole time too um, without really being committed to it and that I think that sort of network effect or social bond or whatever you want to call it made it such that I never thought about changing fields really. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I've never thought about this directly until you just asked me that, but that's kind of the best, you know, post hoc narrative I can come up with why I didn't change. That makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, I think people, if you're the best at what you do, it's like, you should probably do that. Or if you do sure that network, probably stay there. But I think just sometimes people who are younger, you have a lot of optionality, especially out of a PhD yeah. program. You're like, yeah. what do I do? And even to this day, right, today, it's like, do I work on CRISPR? Or do I work on sequencing? Do I work on ag tech? Do I work on, like, Toriyama? It's like there's a lot of different subfields now versus 20, sure. 30 years ago. And so it, it's just like a level, order of magnitude, probably harder to, like, figure out where to focus your time because it's something I dealt with, too. Like, what do you actually want to be the best at? It's actually pretty hard. So what you're saying is like social, social kind of connections kind of keep you. Is if you make enough connections and network somewhere, you'll, you'll probably either be have good taste in people though. That's the caveat, probably. You probably have. I to guess like, that's right. Yeah, um, you know, but I do think generally speaking, and this is something I probably. No, I knew intellectually when I was younger, I had to really force myself because I was, I'm, I'm basically a natural introvert. I'm sort yeah. of, you know, a functioning, whatever, ambivert or something. But the more people you run into and establish some connection with, the better. And I, I had the great fortune in that PhD program I was in at Wash U because of the field being so young. Uh, the seminar speakers who came through was sort of the who's who of who was in that field at that time because there are only like 25 names of people that were doing anything that was worth looking at and the the great thing that wash you did was they had this student um a seminar series that catered to the grad students so the the departmental seminar would be on a day x and on day x minus one 
for two hours, that speaker would meet with just the students and go over all the background of their field so that when you went to the seminar the next day, you knew the whole story and you could keep up just like somebody had studied it for years. And more importantly, they had dinner that night end of X minus one and anybody who wanted to go could go. And so I was like, well, number one, it's free food. And I learned pretty quickly, number two, I got to meet all these people. And you know, these are folks, in many cases, I still am in contact with some of these people. We're talking 35, 40 years later, you know, folks who are now well retired. Even. So those little, you know, that's the kind of stuff that makes your your feeling of an impact more significant. It gives you a feed forward of feeling like you're successful and you matter and all that, which, you know, it's, it sounds stupid to say it now, but man, when you're like 24, 25, that counts for a lot, right? You can feel pretty insignificant if you're gutting it out in the lab every day. None of your stuff's working. You're reading all these papers by other people and they're famous. And, you know, you start realizing, hey, they're just like normal people too. And by the way, you can learn quite a bit from them also. So, you know, that's one thing I've really tried to do a lot of is meet as many people as I can. And then you just, just for the sake of doing it, because it's good in and of itself as an end unto itself with zero thought about any further outcome. But by the way, further outcomes do come from that. If you're not going at it in a in a prescriptive, I need to meet that guy because he's going to be good for my career. It's more like I need to meet that person because they're interesting and I want to find out what they care about and what they do. And, you know, so anyway, That's a good point. So, okay. So Scott, you met Scott, your co-founder of Agbiome, first day of grad school. You joined Steve as a postdoc. What did he do? Was he always an entrepreneurial? Who was the spark there? Was he yeah, always kind of like- I think more. You, you should, I would highly recommend you talk to him too. He's had a really interesting journey. He was probably more naturally entrepreneurial for sure than I was. Um, did a bunch of different odd jobs stuff, had a, a company for a while that did like HVAC maintenance that he was doing. Um, and I think he more so than me was, how do I want to put it, sort of marching to his own drummer, like really felt like he could do it better or differently. You know, I was more amenable to playing corporate politics up to a point, you know, a lot of stuff and that that's not all negative. It's but like sensing the signals and who, you know, who's in power and that kind of stuff in the big company that just seemed to be a path that was pretty natural and easy for me. I think particularly given the upper management of the company was Swiss, they're kind of quiet, unassuming. I, I sort of vibe with those guys pretty well. Um, so that probably accounted for why I did it as long as I did. And then Scott decided to leave with another guy that we were both working for, John Riles, in 97 to co-found this Paradigm Genetics. And I, I basically stayed behind at that point. And I made a pretty calculated decision. You know, they wanted me to come with them or they offered it. Yeah. I had three kids at that point under the age of five. Um, I had a good career at the company, you know, and it, there was a, a certain amount of this was a straight up cash flow calculation, right? Um, which I don't think I, I, I would have made the same decision a thousand out of a thousand times. Um, but I do, you know, I, I was, so I was a little bit of a late starter to the entrepreneurial journey compared to what could have happened. Um, and, you know, that would have worked out fine, too, probably, although maybe if I was a co-founder of that company, it would have screwed up. You never know what the what would have happened, you know, if you change the counterfactual a little bit. But I remember hearing the paradigm story, uh, the IPO roadshow where it's like you guys went public, but the company went public just on time before the bubble burst. Yeah, Scott, Scott can that. tell you all about that. They, there was, a, you know, the first sort of genomics and IT bubble, if you will, was in the late 90s, right? If you look at the NASDAQ index, you can see this very clearly. And then the whole thing kind of turned over in 2000. And there was a blip where um, Tony Blair and Clinton both got up in front of a press conference and said that they're, you know, basically the human genome, nothing should ever be patented from it. And all, and all the genomics company stocks tanked that day. And that's like just when Paradigm was starting to raise money. I'm cool. simplifying it a little bit and Scott can tell you more, but they managed, there was a second window. They got out through that window. They went public and, um, you know, the company did fine. Yeah. But, you know, it was one of those, it did eventually nose over and, and get the pieces got acquired by other folks. So one quick cool question. 
how did you and Scott keep in touch over a decade? Was it like, do you guys, do you, were you just really best friends or was it like, do you call every six months? You invite them to a, a, we were, a family? Yeah, together? I mean, we were, we were best friends. I'd say there's probably some tension in that 97 to 2000 window a little bit because um, some of the stuff they were, some of the stuff they were doing was arguably an offshoot of ideas that we together had had within the Novartis empire. Um, and, but, you know, we still were social. I saw him several times a year. He, you know, we both live right here in North Carolina, so it was easy to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. And then, so over the course of that 40-ish years now since we met, but we did the calculation, about two thirds of that we've worked together, probably coming up on uh, more like, you know, maybe, five i don't know seven eighths <laughs> the longer we're here together so well, but like we've I, always I, been close we, i have a then, like they, that. yeah yeah and it's you no know, i think the real the huge benefit to me and i think scott would say the same thing is to have somebody to talk to about whatever's going on you know we, we get a little bit of backscatter about the co-ceo thing because it's it doesn't fit people's mental map of how things ought to work but yeah. it's it's a power in the sense that you know, it's a pretty isolating job and having somebody that you can talk to about anything is really great. It's like, it's like great emotionally. It also leads to, I think, better, more considered decisions. I tend to be somebody who's like, gut, let's just go do it. Scott is more methodical about laying out options before choosing. That's super helpful for me. And, you know, we just have subtly different ways of looking in the world despite the fact we've known each other so long so you get i think you get a better outcome as a result totally agree. the challenge for some of the people some of the people here see it you know that we're like monolithic and when we've made up our mind together it's like forget it you can't change it which it's not really true but i can see how people can get that um, impression too but we'll talk about agbound's organization and how that relates to this whole story cool okay so you're Siba, Sandos, Novartis, and then he finally get promoted to the top, one of the top spots in Syngenta after it spins out. C-suite. Um, and that's when Scott pulls you out, finally, from corporate America to do crop solution. Why did you end up, like, you, got, you, got, you, you, you climbed the corporate ladder to the top, essentially, and that's when you left. <laughs> that sounds, from the outside looking in, sounds crazy, but maybe in the moment was the smartest thing to do. But how did you finally, how did Scott finally get you out of corporate America to finally start a company with them? Yeah, it was kind of simultaneous. I think we got each other out in that case. I was, if for me, there was a push and a pull. So I was repelled by some of the stuff that was going on within Syngenta. And I saw what the job was going to be for the next several years, which was going to be a cost cutting exercise. Because all the stuff that, you know, this is, a, I think, a lesson to anybody that goes to work for a big company, however, you know, sort of bench level entry, the more you can learn about that company, the better off you're going to be. Take advantage of the resources you've got, including all the stuff that gets communicated inter or externally by the top level people in the company. So, you know, you start reading, it's like, okay, we're going to merge these two companies, we're going to pile as much debt onto it as we can and still have it have a high bond rating and then we're going to take cost out for the next three years that's literally what the pitch was to the investment community so if you're sitting there you're thinking okay my job is going to be to you know whittle away at this organism for the next three years it's not going to be a building job at all and that's just not very much fun and you know it's kind of a I'd, I'd rather you go into science because you want to learn new stuff and discover things and have a growth mindset, not a, you know, who are we going to fire this week kind of thing. Yeah. So I just didn't want to participate in it. And, you know, there are some interpersonal things that were going on too um, with some of the, my former colleagues that when I saw how they behaved, put into a milieu where arguably it's a little bit of Lord of the Flies when two companies come together, you know, last man standing kind of thing. Some of the behaviors I saw were just not things I wanted to be associated with. Let's put it that way. So it was pretty easy. So I, I like decided I was going to leave and then figure out what the hell else I was going to do. And then around that same time, Scott was thinking he was going to leave Paradigm. And we, we ended up connecting up with a dude that had an interesting looking technology. And we thought we could get something going around that. So that was really the genesis of it. 
Okay, so you build a crop solution. It doesn't work out. What was your? This is your entrepreneurial experience. You stop after ten years building up a career. You do a startup and it doesn't work out. What was your? Did you have a bad impression about startups, or you're like, man, that was so fun. Let's do it again, despite it not working. I had a I had a bad impression. I think we, you know, we. I will, I will say we were incredibly resilient. Like what we managed to wring out of a really crappy situation was still pretty damn good. Yeah. Just you know, we were raising money. We had a board meeting on nine eleven of two thousand one. Like we're in a board meeting when the planes crashed into the World Trade Center, and we were approving a term sheet from a European investor to lead our Series A financing. Which, by the way, the European investor then said we're not going to invest in the U.S. anymore after the Trade Center attacks. So the whole, you know, the, the world went into financial lockdown effectively for some period, and. Back in that time frame, so like 2001 to 2007, let's call it, the number of VC firms that were investing in anything like ag was very, very small, like maybe five or six total, which is pretty remarkable if you look at the landscape now. So I, I got pretty, I wouldn't say soured, but I was like beat up by the end of that. I didn't, you know, and I wanted to do something that was... Um, and I'm pretty directionally different from that. And that's how I ended up working with the Two Blades Foundation. Um, and, you know, it was, it was really great from like a flexibility of time commitment standpoint. I had to travel a ton, but I sort of made my own hours. I was, you know, working remote back before that was a thing for several years, which was really good at that stage of my life, too. So you but I still had the like, I mean, you know, you, there's still something in there. It's like, what if we'd done this or that? Mm. And if this had gone a little differently, and, you know, it's so. Your head the, if we did that one thing, would it work? I'm trying to figure out what was in your head at the time where it's like, it didn't work out, but you're still doing it. You so you, you end up starting a company that was successful. So like between Crop Solution Ag Biome, just what was in your head? And it seemed like, man, that was really hard. But if we did these few things, it would have worked. And so I, I'm trying to figure out, well, and you work yeah. in nonprofits. What, what was the? How did you and and, and Scott get back together? To start Ag Bio. Uh, in two thousand twelve or eleven. Um, yeah, two thousand twelve. Yeah, two thousand twelve. And yeah, so he he um you know what decided to leave Bayer. I think he got a little tired of some of the machinations internally over there, despite loving living in Germany. And again, he can tell you the story better than I can. Yeah. But uh, he came back here and had a few months to sit around and think kind of and was c coming up with some novel ideas about what we could do. And, we, you know, we both saw the handwriting on the wall that there was a real need for new ways to protect crops. And there was this unexploited natural resource, which is all the microbial communities on the planet. Um, and he he had done a, a lot of thinking about that and realized there's pretty interesting business opportunity around it potentially. Then we we together started talking about it. The, the critical juncture it sounds goofy, but we actually were we we both he got me into cycling back in grad school and I've been into it ever since. And so we were out on a bike ride and he was like, well, you know, explain to me about this idea around a company. And then he just out of nowhere said, well, do you think you'd be interested in helping out? And I was like, well, yeah, probably would, you know? So next thing I knew, um, you know, we're co-founding this thing. And we got uh, two academics involved, two Jeff Dangle uh, here at the University of North Carolina, Howard Hughes investigator, and Paul schultz Leaford at the Max Planck in Cologne, who together were kind of pioneering this idea of let's understand the plant-associated microbiome. And coincidentally, they published back to back papers that were on the cover of Nature like that month. I think it was September or October of 2012. So the timing was really good. We, we got them in as co-founders. There were a bunch of investors that were thinking that was a thesis they were interested in and wanted to do more. And so we got the timing kind of ideal for getting it going. Um, so that was really the genesis of it. And then, you know, we knew it, we hadn't worked around here for a while. We knew some people together that pretty quickly came together to be the nucleus, like the first six employees that would like take the empty room and, you know, close your eyes and come back a week later. And it's a fully functioning lab, that kind of thing. Right. Those, those are really valuable people to have. Only really possible because 
it seems like Agbound was like 10, 20 years in the making. Like it took you know it's all this whole journey to finally get to a point where you have the network, the, the trust, and the experience to like build something that a, a viable startup. Also on the cycling part, I remember I used to go run in Berkeley Hills. Carl, you probably got your sons involved in cycling because I would see Carl or Fred. I forgot which one. Yeah, sure. They would be cycling in the Berkeley Hills. I'd be running like, oh, why are they cycling too? Yeah, they <laughs> took they took it up pretty early actually, and they've taken it to levels beyond what I've done. But yeah, because it, you know it's great <laughs> riding out there too, right? So and they ride over in Marin a bunch now and still come back over to the East Bay. So it's one of the things we like to do together too. Like when we're we're all together. We'll, there's just I've like had friends that do cycling in Ironman, and they go cycle from Golden Gate to all the way to Simpson Beach. So it's just like this really yeah. windy road. Uh, yeah, right, cycling, right. That's pretty pretty dangerous. I don't know. I ha it seems pretty. Um, I had a friend. I was talking to a friend yesterday. Her husband broke her foot. Broke his foot cycling. So there's these injuries that happen. You, you, have, to, you have to have good situational awareness, right? There's always crazy people driving, um, but it. Um, net net it's not a super risky activity at least that's the narrative i've created for myself <laughs> so you do an ag biome what was the vision not only from a scientific perspective but from an organizational perspective what makes ag biome really unique it's, it's non-hierarchical where you maybe you can explain it better than me maybe talk about that vision for the company the origins and and why like you decided to yeah. design your company in a certain way that was a lot different, different than any other company in the world. Yeah, we um, back in 2001, uh, I read a one page interview in Forbes with a guy named Jim Barron, who was on the faculty at Stanford Business School. And he had done a study on the impact of company culture on success of the company, basically measured through different financial metrics. Um, it, what what he done was basically create what he called a typology of cultures, having surveyed hundreds of startups in, in basically in the Silicon Valley era area with his with his uh, grad students, and they they arrived at the conclusion that this model that they called commitment was highly correlated with both resilience of the company and long term financial success. And the commitment model basically said. You hire people as if they're going to spend the rest of their career with you. And there's this two-way commitment between employee and company where the employee is going to make that leap of trust that the company has its the person's best interest at heart and vice versa. Um, we Every time we hire somebody, we tell them, we're making ourselves vulnerable to you coming in the door. We're going to say we trust you based on in most cases relatively limited experience right even if you do as thorough a job as you can vetting people so that really appealed because this long-term relationship aspect we felt was critical for being really innovative if you look at how science is you know you were saying before we got started science is really hard it's like yeah most stuff doesn't work and it takes forever other than that, it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. having people that are around that are really down for the struggle and realize, you know, we're going to be at this together for years before we see anything like success is super important. Then another dimension is when you a critical success factor for a company like ours is our interactions with the outside world and with partner companies. And being able to show a partner the face of an organization that has some longitudinal stability is really great. Like the same, you're going to deal with the same folks. These same folks are passionate about what they do. They really bought into what this company is about. And so that, that was really the seed crystal of it. We started doing that back in crop solution. And then we kind of doubled down on it when we started Ag Biome to the point where we got in touch with Barron, who since had moved to Yale uh, mm -hmm. School of Management. And Jim came here and did a case on Ag Biome. I think he was like so um, flattered that somebody actually read his article and then actually acted on it. So we've stayed in pretty close touch with him. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting model. It's hard to manage because you can put yourself in situations where you maybe wouldn't move as expeditiously as you would otherwise. Like this person's not working out. Our first instinct is what can we do 
to help them or put them in a role where they're going to be happier and their contributions are going to be more valuable rather than get rid of them and next person up, which is how most other companies are. And I don't, I, I can't claim that's better. I, it's different. It feels better. I think people here appreciate that. Um, you know, it, it has upsides and downsides, but it's a, it's something that we're pretty familiar with now. Cool. I think there's a few companies like that. There's a company called Aldebaran in Fargo, North Dakota. And people, if you join that company, you're probably there for life. And so they, they those places cultivate unique cultures that like yeah. you know, a little loyalty. And um, it also seems like people are very honest with each other. If you get to know somebody longer, you're more willing to be like, yeah. have a different conversation. But like, why did you implement this structure in crop solution and if not like did, did, did you do you feel that like organizing your company in this way enabled ag biome success like without it would ag biome be different would it have failed would it you know yeah. something else happened? well it's valid questions uh, crop solution we experimented with it that company never got more than about 20 22 employees but you know we we had the remarkable experience there was the day when we basically told people, look, we're out of money. We can't pay you next pay period. And there was this sort of like, okay, what do we do now? And I was like, like, well, you don't, you don't have to work here anymore. You know, there was so much buy into what we were doing that the, we had like nobody leave, despite the fact that we were extremely transparent with what was going on financially. Yeah. Almost had to sort of tell people, hey, look, you're not employed here anymore because the definition of employment is you get paid to do work. So okay. that was a really strong lesson in how much loyalty you can generate if you're open with people. And you know, one component of this that we took on board was really like you've got to supply a lot of information to people if you and then put people in a position where they can make the best decisions for the company without being told what to do. And so some of this gets to like how we're structured now. I think what both Scott and I repelled are repelled by the idea that somebody at an arbitrary level on an org chart makes a decision about something that they know nothing about that's happening, you know, three or four levels below them. So why not put the person who's closest to that work in a position where they can make the decision? Mm -hmm. And that is really good for a lot of people. I think you have to be super into being very committed to your job. You have to put yourself out there and really survey the landscape and understand what's going on in the company and ask a lot of questions and consult a lot of people for to be successful if you do all that it's an incredibly rich growth environment for people if you're closed off to that you think you can you know best without asking anybody else um or you're sort of overly suffering from dunning kruger type effects where you think you know more than you do it can be pretty toxic you can make some pretty crappy decisions and so one of the challenges of this system is putting up enough guardrails if you will that people can't if wl gore they call them below the waterline hits you want to make sure you're not putting people in positions where they're gonna make a decision that's a below the waterline hit and that's a you know it's a dynamic tension right you got to sort of keep Keep it tight enough that you know what's going on, but loose enough that people are able to really get engaged with their work and not just show up and say, well, I don't know. I just do what they tell me. Like, that's the worst that case. Maybe right? there's a between organizational structure and then your growth. So you, yeah. as a company focused on the plant microbiome, you become the market leader. My information has been outdated. I think you might have one of the largest or the largest database of plant microbiomes in the world. So like a huge catalog of these things um, and you develop, you, you have commercial products now and like also a backlog of archive products too. Uh, you have like yeah. two products in the market and you have a ton of archive products. Um, uh, and so maybe we could talk about the interplay between like the actual organization and then how you develop the platform and these products. Like when you had to figure out like how to build the platform, how were committees formed? You know, for tough decisions around like which yeah. direction to tiebreakers, like do you have these kind of heat 
fiery conversations and because like it's not just you and stop making decisions it's committees of your teammates helping make decisions and i'm sure there were some controversial directions that worked out or maybe the pivot too sure for sure uh so you know it, it it the thing grew organically the first couple of years you can get everybody in one room when something's happening that matters and we did a lot of that and i think so you know as long as it, of course there's certain people are going to dominate the discussion and the decision making and that includes the co-founders it includes the first the handful of first employees we had we have a great guy named dan tom so He's our first chief science officer. And, you know, we we would debate stuff pretty vigorously in the open, which I think made some people pretty uncomfortable. But then, you know, once we're in, we we didn't explicitly call it this, but it was sort of like a agree and commit or disagree and commit type culture. So when when a decision got made, it was like, that's what we're going to do. Um, that it's harder to maintain that as the company grows different people in different pockets of the company have different styles of communication and different managerial styles too and uh, uh you know i think in some cases we probably historically erred on letting people have too much freedom that really didn't know what they were doing with respect to how to uh elicit the best outcome from the team they were working with right that that just goes on i think it happens everywhere um the committee stuff that you mentioned, that was a really specific uh, desire to involve people in the company more. So we started, we, we heard there's a book called Reinventing Organizations by this guy, Lil Lou, that we got turned on to that uh, after we were already doing a bunch of this stuff, we realized, hey, we're not uniquely crazy. There's other companies like this too. And instead of having like explicit staff functions that did these different roles in the company, we put together these groups of people that were responsible for that. So they're actually, you know, working on the company as well as working in the company. We still do quite a bit of that and it helps people to feel way more involved. They're not just like farming everything out to some, you know, disembodied HR group. We've got a really talented head of HR, Elizabeth Claypool, who has been willing to deal with all this crazy shit too. Because <laughs> you know, you think about it, the typical HR leader is like, "Well, that's all in my domain," and she's really good about involving other people. And you know, there are great growth opportunities for folks too if they want to learn better how to lead. Um, you can run one of these committees or be responsible for some initiative within the company culturally or process wise and so you know we're we're as, as we've grown we've definitely put more things in place that make things more consistent across the company that of course gets some people back up because it's not like it was when we had 30 or 40 people we got like 120 now but that in the the cause of making things more consistent is to try to simplify it's not to complexify or bureaucratize it's to like okay every time we do this thing we don't need to reinvent the wheel about how to do it let's just do it the way that we know best to do it and then we'll tweak it as we figure out better ways to do it so you know that's been an ongoing um process and will be forever as the company continues to grow too i think it's, it's remember john hamer was telling me like yeah, Agbiom has a great culture. You should join them. Like this great, you know, this great team. Everybody loves working there. So kind of testament to you, you doing something different and then making it work over time. So I'm sure there's all these growing pains. And we also talk about then ag tech. And yeah, sure. How to build a, a startup in ag tech. It's really hard because there's, you know, an, an, a, maybe you could touch upon what made ag biome successful in the market the the opportunities in agriculture because they're massive but also the challenges like how do you fit in this like massive market opportunity with like this narrow it seems like a narrow path to that big opportunity mm -hmm. and very few people can get you know fit in that narrow pathway and make it work till the end but how did how do you make an ag tech company that goes from idea to product like commercial product it is extremely hard so you pivot maybe that's it maybe you have one other i'm not remembering but maybe you just talk about yeah how to be successful with ag tech yeah it's well there's no like recipe for it but i think one key is to try to understand what the need of the 
ultimate customer is as much as you can. Like what do growers actually need and or, or what are they what what would they be willing to open their wallets up for? Let me put it that way. I think there's a lot of hammers out there and solution of nails in the ag tech world. Like this looks really cool, but then if it's difficult to explain to somebody or they don't immediately get what the return on investment is from them purchasing that, it's that's tough. And I think there's a ton of that stuff out there. Um, we tried early on really hard to make sure that whatever we were looking for, we we did it in a way that we were convinced we could identify a level of activity and efficacy that would actually prove out to turn into a good product. You know, the sooner you can filter things at whatever level in the lab or greenhouse or the field, the better off you are. So we, you know, we worked really hard on this is what this product has got to do if we're going to try to get it to market. So I think that was pretty important for us. And then, in, you know, we've also done a lot of revenue and partnering in areas outside of ag. So we have a genome editing platform that we we sold for human therapeutic use to elevate bio. We've done work in animal health. We've got a bio mining deal. Um, we have trait discovery for GM insect control traits and corn and soybean. And all of those came from either sensing a market need and building the platform specifically for that or serendipitously, hey, we already have this platform. We have a ton of these genes sequenced what's in here that looks interesting or partner we run into and they're like, Hey, we're interested in trying to do something like that. Do you guys think you could do that? So it's almost an extension of what I said earlier about interpersonal connections, it's like making the contacts with the different potential partners and getting into a real learning conversation with them about what they want. Um, whether that's a grower all the way at the product level or whether that's another company that we're going to do an R&D deal with. I think that's rather than like, this is my technology. I love my technology. I'm going to explain to you till I'm blue in the face how great my technology is. Don't you want my technology? And about 10 seconds into it, you were like looking the other way, like, I don't understand this shit. Why would I want it? Right. <laughs> Instead of getting into more of a you know, listening conversation. What are your problems? What are you trying to solve? What are you interested in? You know, that kind of thing, right? And then of course, having a heavy dose of, well, by the way, we have something like this and that. So I think that that's a big piece of it is the kind of, you know, relationship challenger sale, whatever you want to call it, where you're like talking to people and getting to expand their horizons. So, so how did you also make that transition from platform to product? I think biotech companies in general have that issue and it seems like ag bio build platform you get a network yeah to partner up to kind of validate your platform and get to a point where you can actually launch your own products and so you've launched a series of fungicides um how did you how did your organization figure out that hey we want to do this ourselves and how has it been like to make that transition from say discovery tech company to commercial company where you're now you're in the field and you're talking to growers and you're trying to get them to use your product. Yeah, we realized pretty early on that trying to partner our agricultural biological products as product candidates was probably not going to be successful as a business model. The reason being there, it, we were discussing quickly before we got on here. There's now, you know, four or five companies max that are really yeah. credible partners for a lot of this stuff that, you know, worldwide big, big guys. Um, and it, almost all of them have, have been, at least for the last 10 years or so, in a mode of bring it to me after it's already on the market, fully de risk selling, and then I'll actually probably overpay for it versus sure, I'll take that on and share risk with you early. If companies will do that. They won't afford you any value for it though until the thing is on the market anyway. So we made the calculation back in like 2016, I guess it was, we should just take these things all the way to market because it's the only way to get the real true external validation that a partner is gonna want in order to acquire a product from us. Moreover, if we do it well, we don't care if they get acquired because we'll sell enough of them and we'll make money off of them. So that was the reason. It was really a market dynamics thing. Um, and it's a huge transition. We underestimated how difficult it is for sure. I don't think there's probably too many companies that have launched a product that wouldn't say that. 
um, figuring out how to make the damn stuff reproducibly early on, tough. Um, finding the right partners to help do the contract manufacturing, uh, and then building up a team that has the right uh, mixture of experience in ag, but also an entrepreneurial mindset that can think of new ways to take stuff out there that isn't sort of doing it the same way other companies have always done it. Because if we just do that, we're going to lose, right? We're tiny and you got these other guys that have hundreds of salespeople. So we've got to be a little bit um, nimble and, and willing to take some risks about how we take stuff to market um, in order to have any chance of being successful longer term. I bet the sales trips are really fun. I love, I used to do diligence on growers. You go visit these farms. It's so fun to go visit a farm and sell to a farmer grower and be able to like, you know, it, 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 I'm sure the sales trips are really good. They take you on a, they take you on a tour of their, of their facility. And that's probably think, the exhilarating like, part. Yeah. 90 plus percent of the people you meet are super open and smart yeah. and, down to earth and willing to share what their problems are and all that stuff, right? So yeah, that's they're awesome, awesome customers. So you're the, you're the people you want to help, and so yeah. uh, just yeah, it's sure. just that sure. the market structure is the difficult part. <laughs> that's yeah, the issue. No, that's right. That's right. Just, and you know, and then you get the you get retail distribution who we sell to, who then sell to the growers, and the yeah. retail distributors are all incentivized to work with the big companies because the big companies pay them pretty handsomely to carry their stuff, right? They give them good margins or give them rebates and you name it. So it can be really tough for a small, tiny company like ours that has a limited product line to break into that and get any sort of bandwidth. That said, we've had good luck with it where we are able to make contact, you know, face to face with those retail distributors. They'll, they'll pick our stuff up. Everybody's looking for real innovation in this space. You know, as I mentioned at the start, one of the reasons to get the company going was we need new ways to protect crops. Everybody yeah. still needs it. So. Absolutely. And so maybe wrap it up, just like any final lessons to aspiring ag tech founders, uh, maybe lessons to people who are working in corporate America, thinking about a startup, kind of any kind of, you know, final thoughts or maybe tidbits of wisdom you want to give these people? Wow. I Well, I think it's super important to keep thinking about what new things could come about. It's, it's easy, you know, at my age to be like, oh, I've seen it all. I know that won't work. It's yeah. great to keep ginning up ideas all the time because there's umpteen new ways that things can happen or cool things that can happen overlaid with you know try as early as possible trying to figure out okay what would actually the business model for that be i think that's where a lot of would-be young entrepreneurs have a weakness it, it's like they're super strong on idea generation and technology and their excitement level and all that is off the charts it needs just enough of that how are you going to make money from that piece in order to work and that i would argue that's more challenging in ag just because it isn't like this standard like drug discovery model where it's like well if we can get it to preclinical or then we can get it to phase one you know and you have these inflection points and you know that other things being equal at some point the market's going to be really interested in that if it's a new chemical entity or a new target or whatever and in ag it's different it's um there's really strong like price thresholds people aren't going to pay over x per acre for certain kinds of things it's got to have an economic return for the grower it's not getting paid for by some insurance scheme public or private so you know having some basic understanding of like the economics of how how that sub market you're going into works is that's super important so i'd encourage people to do that and then you know people that are in big companies that know a lot of this stuff already it's like there's okay the current market is going through a dip no doubt compared to a year and a half ago but there's never been more interest in investing in ag among generalist private equity and venture investors this is the all-time peak as far as number of potential participants and so there's a lot of people out there looking for interesting stuff to invest in and there's a lot of companies that can use a dollop of that commercial sense that might have like super cool technology but can't figure out how to monetize it. So, you know, the, the world can be your oyster. You don't have to stay stuck in some 
monolith where your whole job is trying to squeeze cost out every day. It's it's way more fun to grow stuff. At least you know some people think. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I think I think you know there's just in ag tech just need more examples of startups becoming independent companies and totally. big independent companies. And so I think ag biome is definitely that template to follow. So I think if if more people study ag biome and a few other companies. I think there'll be more innovation in agriculture that's needed. But like you said, business model. It's about that market. Yeah. navigating the maze of the market. Because ag tech is really, it's like biotech's hard, but ag tech is like, yeah. it's, a, it's very relational based too. I think, I think that's something, it's conversation too. It's like you reinforce, you have to know the right people and build those relationships, that trust. Because looking back on my experience in ag tech, yeah, there's no, everybody knows each other. Uh, everybody kind of, it is a, Actually, ag tech people would tend to work at the same company for decades versus biotech. Yeah, it can be a, it's a small world. You know, we always joked about, you know, don't burn any bridges or don't piss people off when you leave because you end up being a colleague of somebody who's a competitor a couple of years before that happens more often than not. And, you know, it, 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 it's a, it, I do think what a really heartening thing, I was just at that World Agri-Tech Summit in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. If you look at the number of people that are getting interested in it still, right? Or you go in the startup room and there's like 80 companies that have kiosks in there. That's very heartening yeah, because, you know, and I, there's no, there's so little risk in um, trying something like this typically you know it's like what's the worst that happens as long as you can pencil out what the worst that happens is and it's not existential risk to you why not try it because you learn so much from those things too so yeah well eric thanks for doing this i really appreciate the time i, I know a lot of people are going to find this useful well i'm very gratified to have the opportunity and thanks for reaching out to me to do a job and thanks Absolutely. for doing these i think it's a fantastic idea Cool. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. We'll, we'll talk soon. Have a great day. Sounds great.